الحمد لله دير اور كوليك Uh, welcome to this uh, webinar and as we uh, told you usually we are very committed to continue in uh, from the Saudi Society of Nephrology and Transplantation to continue uh, the educational uh, sessions so today's sessions uh, is uh, talking about the uh, cystinosis and it's being supported by the biologics and without their support we, we cannot continue having the uh, education uh, session. So I would like to thank the uh, sponsoring company for this uh, webinar. Um, uh, without further taking a lot of time, so I will give the mic for uh, Dr. Majid Al-Aufi, who is the senior uh, pediatric nephrology consultant at uh, Military Hospital uh, in Riyadh. Dr. Majid, the mic is yours. Uh, thank you, Dr. Khalid, for uh, giving me this uh, chance to be the moderator of such a, a very interesting uh, session about update in, uh, in nephropathic cystinosis. Uh, it is my pleasure uh, to introduce uh, Prof. Elena uh, Levichenko. Elena Levichenko uh, <clears throat> uh, uh, was uh, trained in pediatric in Brussels followed by fel uh, fellowship in pediatric nephrology and PhD training. Uh, <clears throat> since 2008, she worked uh, in the division of pediatric nephrology of University Hospital of Belgium, initially as a junct chief and starting from 2011 as a chief of this division. She is fellow professor of medicine in the Catholic University Lovin and is a group leader of the Laboratory of Pediatric Nephrology in the Department of Development and Regeneration. She published over 200 original paper and several book chapter mainly focused on unrevealing disease mechanism uh, <clears throat> and improving clinical care of its children with genetic kidney diseases. She is a president of the European Society of, Be of Pediatric Nephrology, a board member of the ASPN working group on inherited renal disorder and an executive board member of the International Pediatric Nephrology Association. Uh, so uh, all of us will come, uh, Prof. Uh, Lefitschenko, and uh, the mic for you now. Thank you very much and good evening, uh, ladies and gentlemen. It's my great pleasure to be invited uh, to this webinar. Um, and. Uh, uh, very much welcome in the field of uh, the rare disease nephropathic cystinosis. So I'm a pediatric nephrologist in Leuven, Belgium. Leuven is a small university city about 20 kilometers far from Brussels. However, last weekend we were very proud that we were in the center of the world attention as the world championship cycling ended in Leuven and you can see the city hall of Leuven and all people working, watching the cyclers which arrived to our city. So now you know where I'm working. So let's start uh, my presentation with a few clinical cases. So the first case I would like to present you is a small girl who was born after 40 weeks of normal pregnancy, normal birth weight, no symptoms until six months of age, and starting from uh, six months, symptoms of failure to thrive, vomiting, delayed mortal development. At nine months, our pediatrician did urine tests and discovered glucosuria and proteinuria. And blood test was done and showed hypokalemia, low bicarbonate, and low phosphate. And here you can see your gross chart showing a gross delay starting from the age of six months. Another patient is again a female, which again was born from the normal pregnancy, no problems until the age of 10 months, when she started to develop progressively uh, rickets. So here you can see the bowing of your legs. So she was treated with vitamin D without any success. And then at the age of two years, again, blood was taken and showed again hypokalemia, metabolic acidosis, hypophosphatemia, and also low vitamin D levels. Another case was again a girl just by chance, there were three females. 
uh, who presented at the age of 11 years with uh, complaints of eye pain and photophobia. Uh, she went to the ophthalmologist and that was a, a doctor who actually immediately could recognize the disease because of the presence of these very characteristic dots in the cornea, which represent cysting crystals. Then this ophthalmologist sent her to our clinics. We did blood tests. They showed normal electrolyte, no metabolic acidosis, normal calcium and phosphate. However, her creatinine was elevated corresponding to a GFR of 77. When we did her urine test, it showed um, proteinuria and glucosuria, leading to the diagnosis of cystinosis. So another, the last uh, clinical case is actually, again, very, very different. It was a male of 17 years of age who presented at the emergency clinic so with very severe headache, blurry vision, very high blood pressure. And actually, it was a new onset of kidney failure, immediately requiring the dialysis. When his blood was tested, you can see the features of their end-stage kidney disease with very high potassium, and again, metabolic acidosis, and very high PTH. The, uh, the urine test in this patient also showed glucosuria and proteinuria. And actually, all these four kids presenting at different ages have the same disease, which we are going to discuss today, and which is nephropathic cystinosis. So what is cystinosis? It is an autosomal recessive disease caused by lysosomal accumulation of amino acid cystine due to defective exodus of cystine out of the lysosomes of the cells. The incidence of cystinosis is about one in 100 to 200,000 new bones. However, in the populations with higher incidence of consanguinity, you have the high incidence of this disease. So when you look um, at all patients with inherited uh, renal Fanconi syndrome, which is a generalized proximal tubular discussion, dysfunction, cystinosis will be the leading cause of inherited renal Fanconi syndrome. Cystinosis is caused by mutations in their gene, which is called CTNS, cloned on their chromosome 17, and encoding the lysosomal protein, which is called cystinosin. In the Northern European population, like we have here in Belgium, the most common mutation is a large 57 KB deletion on the chromosome 17. However, altogether, there are many other mutations described, about 150 mutations today. And the mutation detection rate is very high. Almost in all patients with cystinosis, we do find mutations in the CTNS gene, meaning that it is really a monogenetic disorder. In the Middle East countries, um, like Saudi Arabia, you have a hotspot mutation, which is shown here, which leads to the exonic splice sites. And also in the other population, you have other frequent mutations like our colleague uh, Mohammed Almonam and uh, Nivin Solomon in Cairo, they found a frequent mutation in the Egyptian population. There are genotype phenotype correlation in this disease with severe mutations, mostly leading to a more severe phenotype. So here you can see that um, the CTNS gene encodes the lysosomal cystine transporter called cystinosin. This transporter brings the amino acid cysteine, which is released from the protein degradation in the lysosomes, together with protons out of the lysosomes. In the cytosol, cysteine is reduced to cysteine, so it's half cysteine, which can be used to the other cellular processes. In patients with cystinosis, cystinosis is mutated or absent, and this leads to cysteine accumulation inside of the lysosomes. Cysteine is an amino acid which is purely, purely soluble, and this leads to the formation of cysteine crystals. And these typical hexagonal crystals are found in many tissues of cystinosis patients, and you can find the level of cysteine accumulation in the different tissues with kidney and liver 
being the, really the champions, the tissues which accumulate their highest amount of cysteine. The pathogenesis of cystinosis is very complex. You can see that the figure from the recent uh, review, which we have written together with our colleagues in uh, Utrecht in the Netherlands, which shows you that while lysosomal cystine accumulation is really the key feature of the disease, the pathogenesis also affects other cellular mechanisms, such as increased oxidative stress with increased generation of reactive oxygen species, it uh, disturbs in the mitochondrial function and energy generation by the cells. It impairs cell death mechanisms. Cystinotic cells are prone to the cell death called apoptosis, and it also disturbs their cell death mechanism, which is called autophagy. It also disturbs um, cell signaling pathways, such as mTOR signaling, and also uh, mutations in the cystinosin leads to cell differenti the differentiation, especially in the kidneys. So those of you who are interested in the pathogenesis, I really recommend to read this review because I don't have much time to discuss it in more details. So um, uh, many of you are nephrologists, and so um, I will focus a little bit in more detail on the kidney diseases. So in the kidneys, cystinosis primarily affects kidney proximal tubules, and it causes renal Fanconi syndrome, which is the main disease feature. However, the disease also affects the glomeruli, and uh, in particular, the function of the glomerular epithelial cells, podocyte, and uh, therefore it causes a glomerular proteinuria, and in some patients, the development of focal and segmental glomerulosclerosis. Because cysteine crystals mainly accumulate in kidney interstitium, it co they cause renal interstitial inflammation and the development of uh, renal fibrosis, which progressively leads to the chronic kidney disease and end-stage kidney disease. So let's go back to the clinics. Um, we distinguish three main clinical forms of cystinosis. First of all, the infantile form of nephropathic cystinosis. It is the most frequently diagnosed forms, which presents with a development of renal Fanconi syndrome between three and six months of age, and leads to the end-stage renal disease around the age of 10 years. The milder form, which we call late onset or juvenile form of cystinosis, is more rare and diagnosed in about 5% of the patients. It is characterized by a later onset of um, kidney dysfunction, milder tubulopathy, more pronounced proteinuria, which can be even in the nephrotic range, a later progression rate to end-stage kidney disease. And there is one benign form of cystinosis, which is called the ocular form, so it is not a nephropathic form. This patient presents with ocular complaints because of cystine accumulation in the cornea of the eyes. However, there is an overlap between ocular and juvenile forms of cystinosis, even within the same family. Some patients might present with ocular complaints and do not present the kidney disease when they are children. However, when they become adolescents or young adults, they can develop kidney disease. And therefore it is recommended to follow these patients as well for the signs of kidney disease, which can develop later during their lifetime. So cystinosis is a systemic metabolic disorder. It primarily affects the kidneys. However, during the lifetime of the patients, many other organs will be affected. And this slide shows you the spectrum of organ disease in cystinosis. And you can see that it affects the eyes, causing photophobia, but also keratopathy and retinopathy. Uh, it can also affect endocrine organs such as thyroid, pancreas. It can also affect the liver. It affects the gonades, and it also affects the brain and muscles, uh, which finally can lead to their uh, death of the patients because of muscle atrophy, swallowing different difficulties, and stroke-like episodes. 
So here you can see some examples. This is an example of cystinotic band keratopathy when their corneal cystine crystals are not well treated. This is an example of cystinotic retinopathy, which can lead to the blindness of the patients. Here you can see a hand of one of my patients. Cystinotic myopathy starts with a muscle atrophy of the hand. So when you see this patient, you have always, uh, you have to look at their hands to search for this uh, signs, which can be sometimes very subtle. And it also can lead to the cortical atrophy, which is also very frequently shown in young adults um, which are suffering from cystinosis. So renal Fanconi syndrome is the most frequent feature of cystinosis. Renal Fanconi syndrome is a generalized dysfunction of the kidney proximal tubules and is characterized by the presence of polyuria, amino aciduria, glucosuria, phosphaturia, losses of sodium, potassium, bicarbonate, hypercalciuria, uh, low molecular weight proteinuria, albuminuria. And it is extremely pronounced in cystinosis compared to the other proximal tubular disorders. But it's also important to realize that renal Fanconi syndrome develops gradually. So it starts with amino aciduria, followed by glucosuria, phosphaturia, renal bicarbonate loss until the full-blown renal Fanconi syndrome would develop. So it means which when you examine your patients very early during the infancy, some of the features of full-blown renal Fanconi syndrome can, cannot be present yet. So this slide shows you the biochemical symptoms of full-blown renal Fanconi syndrome. And you can see the same features like low potassium, low bicarbonate, low phosphate, which are very characteristic for these patients. So what are the clinical symptoms of renal Fanconi syndrome? So renal Fanconi syndrome is presenting with failure to thrive and growth retardation, as I have shown you. Vomiting, some patients can suffer from constipation because of hypokalemia and dehydration. Some of the patients can present with rickets, Think about the second patient, which I showed you. And also some patients can present with, uh, with a developmental delay and hypotonia. How do we diagnose cystinosis? First of all, you have to think about this disease as the most common cause of renal Fanconi syndrome in children. You should also think about cystinosis in patients with unexplained eye complaints and photophobia. Patients who present with rickets and are not reacting to the vitamin D treatment. Patients who present with a combination of glucosuria and proteinuria without the presence of diabetes. And in these patients, you especially have to check for the low molecular weight proteins, which are very characteristic for this disorder. And also you have to think about cystinosis in patients with unexplained CKD or end-stage kidney disease, because some of these kids might have cystinosis. How do we diagnose cystinosis? The diagnosis is actually easy. If you can measure cystine in white blood cells. All cystinosis patients have elevated white blood cell cystine levels, and you have the reference values for the patients uh, before the start of the treatments. The parents of the patients have also slightly elevated levels, but they don't suffer from the disease presentations because they are the heterozygous for the cystine S mutations. Patients above the age of one year all will have their cystine uh, crystals in the cornea, which are also pathognomonic for the disorder and are quite easy to diagnose. And finally, we try to confirm the diagnosis of cystinosis by the molecular analysis of cystinosis gene in all patients. Recently, a very interesting paper appeared in the European Journal of Human Molecular Genetics. It's a paper by the German group who applied their um, molecular screening using dry blood spots, which are used for their neonatal screening. They screened about 300,000 new bones and using their next generation sequencing combined with the QPCR technique to screen for the most common mutations present in Germany, they could identify one kid with cystinosis 
who was diagnosed and treated immediately after birth. And now we have a very positive data that at the age of six, 18 months, this child didn't develop no signs of kidney disease. And this is of course very interesting and very important to promote the neonatal screening of cystinosis. However, in the majority of the countries, the diagnosis is of cystinosis is delayed. And here you can see data from the International Cure Cystinosis Registry showing that while in the uh, North America and Europe, the diagnosis of cystinosis is made before the age of 18 months in the majority of the patients, the diagnosis is made much later in South America and probably it is the case in many, many other countries. So very recently, um, um, uh, my colleague Mohamed Almonem um, published a paper uh, and showed that there might be another biomarker of cystinosis, which is a macrophage activation enzyme called chitotriosidase, a very difficult name. This enzyme is released by macrophages when they try to clean cystinosis tissues from cystine crystals. And when you look at patients at diagnosis, in these patients, this enzyme is highly elevated, which might be used to diagnose cystinosis in these patients, especially in the countries where white blood cell cystine levels are not available. And here you can see that also in treated cystinosis patients, the levels of this enzyme are also elevated. And you can see that in Belgian patients, which are usually all treated with cystamine, uh, these levels are lower compared to the Eg Egyptian patients, which were not so well treated. So this enzyme, which is easy to detect, might be used in the countries where white blood cell cystine levels are not available to diagnose and to monitor cystinosis. So how do we treat cystinosis? The treatment of cystinosis consists of two major parts. Uh, one part of the treatment is symptomatic to replace water and electrolyte losses, to replace hormones, for example, when uh, cystinosis affects thyroid, pancreas, or gonads, and also patients who are not well growing despite adequate treatment, we administer growth hormone to stimulate their growth. And we have their system specific treatment with cystamine. It should be administered systemically, but also as eye drops. So this slide shows you the symptomatic treatment of cystinosis. I'm not going here into details. I just show the preparation that you should administer to your patients with renal Fanconi syndrome, potassium preparations, phosphate. Sodium chloride is really required, but usually these patients eat quite a lot of salt. And we have to treat this patient with vitamin D, carnitine, which is also a solute which is reabsorbed in proximal tubules when the levels are lower. And when it's difficult to, to manage uh, the electrolyte losses in Europe, we use indomethacin to reduce diuresis and to reduce electrolyte losses. However, in the countries with a very warm climate, like in Saudi Arabia, we should be very careful because in patients who are dehydrated, the use of endomethacin can cause um, the acute kidney injury, especially when it is combined with ACE inhibitors. So it's a useful treatment, but watch out and uh, use it in, only in patients who are well hydrated and never in combination with ACE inhibitors. So let's talk about cystamine. Cystamine is a specific and the only treatment for cystinosis which allows to deplete cystine accumulations in the lysosome. Cystamine is a small tile which can penetrate the lysosomes and react there with cystine. It breaks the molecules of cystine in two, resulting in the formation of cystine and cysteine cysteamine mixed disulfide as shown in this picture. And these substances can leave cystinotic lysosomes where they are using different alternative transport system, therefore bypassing the mutated cystinosin transporter. 
We know that this treatment is very efficient to deplete cystinotic lysosomes from cystin. So nowadays we have two cystamine formulations, the immediate release cystamine preparation, which we know as cystagol. Uh, here you can see the dose of this formulation used in patients below 12 years of age is 1.3 gram per square meter per day. It should be used every six hours, including the night, because this preparation works only for six hours. In patients uh, who are above 12 years of age or above 50 kilogram, the dosage we are using is two grams per day, again, divided in four daily doses. The maximum dose is 1.95 gram per square meter, and we have to monitor the treatment um, by determining system accumulation in white blood cells. It should be done five to six hours after the last dose. A more recent formulation of cystamine is extended release cystamine formulation. This formulation uh, uh, consists of small, small granules uh, which are put in the capsule. And these granules are solved in their, uh, in their uh, neutral pH. Therefore, it is very, very important not to take these granules with food because this will result in the release of the preparation in the stomach. Uh, however, when uh, this preparation is taken without food or with acidic food, the granules will be released in the small intestine. And this will result in the extended release of the preparation, allowing taking this drug every 12 hours. So this drug also should not be taken with bicarbonate. And to monitor um, this treatment, white blood cell cystine levels should be taken 12.5 hours after the last dose. So usually when you start cystamine in patients with cystinosis, you have to start with a low dose to avoid the appearance of side effects and gradually increase the dose uh, during six to eight weeks. In case of side effects such as nausea, abdominal pain, you have to decrease the dose again and then to start to increase the dose very slowly, trying to reach the um, recommended dose within the time period of um, six to eight weeks. So once again, we have to monitor the treatment um, by measuring white blood cell system levels. And usually we perform these measurements um, in our country in children four times per year, in, in adults uh, one to two times per year, and we try to achieve the cystine value within the range of the heterozygous. Because as I have told you, they have slightly elevated cystine levels, but they don't show signs of the disease. And here you see the recommended levels of white blood cell cystine accumulation in mixed white blood cell preparations and in the granulocytes, which is slightly higher because granulocytes are the cells in blood which preferentially accumulate cystine. Coming um, back to our biomarker and the novel biomarker chitotrazidase, it was a more recent publication by Conrad Weiss in our lab. He showed that this biomarker can be also useful not only for the diagnosing of cystinosis, but also for monitoring the patients as it was associated with uh, white blood cell cystine levels. And you can see that based on the levels of the chitotrazidase, we could distinguish patients who were well-treated and had lower white blood cystine levels and patients who were not well-treated and had higher blood cell cystine levels. Also, this biomarker was predictive for the development of extra renal complications. And now we have a new study um, using different patient cohorts to validate this biomarker before it can be applied in the routine clinical practice. So cystamine treatment is very efficient. It postpones the deterioration of renal function, it improves the growth of the patient, and it postpones or even prevents the development of extra renal complications. And here you can see the data of a very recent analysis done in the large European cohort of cystinosis patients published very recently in Kidney International. And this study shows 
that there is really almost a linear relationship between the age at start of cystamine treatment and the risk to develop end-stage kidney disease. So the earlier you start cystamine treatment, the better is the prognosis of kidney disease in your patients. The study also showed that um, there is a relationship between white blood cell cystine levels and the risk to develop end-stage kidney disease in the patients. And you can see that when the patient have white blood cell cystine levels below one, their risk to develop end-stage kidney failure is much lower than when the patient have these levels above two. So once again, it makes sense to monitor treatment and try to stay within the recommended levels. So the compliance with cystamine treatment is also very, very important. And the next slide, which will appear in a second. I apologize for this delay. I think I will have to share my screen again because I think my screen has disappeared. So I think you can see my screen again, and I apologize for this um, technical problem. So this study from the group of Bill Gold showed that um, each year of compliance with cystamine treatment delays their progression of uh, uh, kidney failure with one year. So the compliance in the patients is very important and we should try to stimulate the compliance. So just um, to remind you that cystinosis affects many other extrarenal organs because it's a really a systemic disorder. And these are the percentages which are found in patients who are untreated with cystamine. However, several studies have shown the cystamine therapy prevents or postpones extrarenal complications. So you should not stop cystamine treatment after kidney transplantation to protect uh, extra renal organs. And this has been demonstrated by the large cohort of cystinosis patients followed um, in, uh, in the United States that each year on cystamine therapy prevents the development of complications such as myopathy, such as pulmonary dysfunction, such as diabetes. And the more recent study has also showed that neurological complications of cystinosis, such as cortical atrophy, such as abnormal white matter signals, and also cognitive defects, seizures and stroke, memory defects, all can be prevented when the patients have good compliance with cystamine therapy. So cystamine is a difficult drug to administer. And all of us who treat cystinosis patients would mention that a lot of patients, it's about one quarter, will have some complaints, which are listed here. So um, it is very important to motivate the patients to take the drug and uh, try to convince them that the drug is very important for them to prevent their kidney function deterioration and to protect their kidney, their other organs. What is also important to realize that the side effects of cystamine are very similar between cystagon and prosystamine. So what is also very important to mention that systemic cystamine doesn't reach the eyes of the patients. 
and therefore we need to use cysteamine eye drops. And now there are two preparations on the market, cysta drops, which are viscose gel preparation, which should be administered four times daily to solve um, cysting crystals in the cornea. And cysteron, which is a fluidic preparation, which should be administered every hour during the week time. There are some also hospital pharmacies which prepare the hospital preparations, but what is very important that your patients should be regularly seen by the ophthalmologist to evaluate their eye complications. So how do we follow cystinosis patients? In our hospital, we follow children every three months. We measure growth, we check their feeding, we check the biochemical parameters, and we adjust their treatment. We also have a multidisciplinary clinics for adult patients, also for adjusting their system in those, and also for check their eyes, their endocrine organs, their muscles, their brain, and to adjust their treatment accordingly. So what I would like you to remember, I think you should remember that cystinosis is a treatable disease. And so the earlier the diagnosis, the earlier start of cystiamine, the better is prognosis of your patients. You can diagnose cystinosis at any age in patients who can present with very different complaints. And all these patients will need to be treated with cystiamine. So I would like to stop here by thanking you all for your attention. And uh, here you can see the hospital I'm working in Leuven. And I would be very happy to answer your questions now or by email if you will have some additional questions in the future. Thank you very much for your attention. Thank you very much, Prof. Uh, uh, Elena. Uh, it was very interesting uh, talk and uh, we enjoy it. Uh, <clears throat> We will open uh, now the uh, the uh, for uh, the question. So uh, I will read for you some of the uh, question that has been uh, sent uh, to us. So um, the first question is talking about the uh, the use of the cytotriosidase uh, uh, act enzyme activity instead of WBC-16 test uh, to assess the control of the disease. Uh, uh, any comment about that? Yeah, so as um, I have shown, this um, biomarker was demonstrated in our laboratory mm -hmm. and um, together with our colleagues in Egypt. So yes. cytotriosidase is released by macrophages and it is elevated in cystinosis patients. So it seems to be a good biomarker. It's very easy to measure, it's very stable, it's also cheap. Um, it is not specific for cystinosis. It is also used as a biomarker in another lysosomal storage disease, as a Gaucher disease. However, it seems to be very useful. I think it's a little bit too early to take it now to the routine clinical practice because we are busy with the validation as, as a biomarker. And what is clear for us now that it is probably a long-term biomarker. You can compare it with glucose and uh, hemoglobin A1C in diabetes. The glucose is in, in diabetes is changing very quickly but it doesn't reflect a long-term control of the disease. It's a little bit the same for cystinosis. The white blood cell cystin levels are fluctuating a lot depending on the compliance of the patients, while cytotriosidase seems to be a more long-term marker of cystin accumulation in different tissues of cystinosis patients. One of the common questions that usually come to us from our adult uh, colleagues is that why we should, uh, 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 do we need to still use cystiamine after kidney transplant? Yeah, thank you for this question. This is really very, very important. Um, as I have shown you, um, the cystiamine treatment should be continued after kidney transplantation not for the kidney because obviously the transplanted kidney doesn't have the disease, but it is very important for the extra renal organs 
Because the disease, it is not only the kidney disease, it's a systemic disorder which affects all organs of the cystinosis patient. So in all patients, also after kidney transplantation, cystamine should be continued. So never stop it. We do discontinue it only for a few days because when the patient is transplanted, uh, probably uh, he or she will not be able to take cystamine immediately. But as soon as the patient is able to take oral drugs, we will restart cystamine treatment after transplantation. Okay, thank you very much. Uh, I have a question. Um, hematobiotic stem and progenitor cell transplant is an increasingly used uh, to treat, as a treatment option for numbers of lys uh, lysosomal storage disease. So uh, where we are standing in terms of the research uh, about the use of this modality for treatment in patient with nephropathic cystinosis? Yeah, thank you for this question. I didn't have time to go there um, in detail because it's still uh, very experimental. Um, based on the studies in the mouse model of cystinosis, um, there is a clinical trial now started in the, um, in the San Diego by the group of Stephanie Cherki, uh, together with a company which is called Avro Beer. So, so far they transplanted, so it's a phase one, phase two clinical trial, and they transplanted now three patients with cystinosis. Um, actually, it's five, phase one, phase two clinical trial, so it's mainly meant to evaluate the safety of the treatment, and so far, no major adverse events have been demonstrated. However, we really need to wait to see whether this treatment will be efficacy. And uh, so, they all together, they plan to, to transplant six patients in this uh, phase one, phase two. And I think when these results will be encouraging, they will go to phase three. And then this will be really the trial which will, will, will show whether this treatment is also efficacy. Because it should work for the lifetime of the patients. We really don't know um, whether this treatment uh, will really cure cystinosis. Okay. Another question from uh, uh, about, is there any other drugs that can decrease the bioavailability of cystiamine? And also another question about how to improve the tolerance to cystiamine drugs other than decreasing the dose temporarily. Again, very good questions. So there are several drugs in the pipeline uh, for cystiamine. There is, um, by the group in UK, the system in uh, prodrug. So this is um, a molecule which is uh, after the ingestion will be transformed to the system in by the body. And um, they have very good results in the animal model. And um, they are preparing uh, the clinical trial and the patient was actually planned in 2020, but it was postponed by COVID. So this is something which will uh, probably be um, in the clinical trial very fast. There are some other drugs which interfere with the different mechanisms of cystinosis. I have shown you that cystinosis not only um, affects the lysosomes by lysosomal cystine accumulation, but it also affects different cellular pathway. And there are some drugs in their, in their pipeline which try to interfere uh, with a different pathway. So these drugs are now at the phase of animal trials and some of them were published, but they are not yet, not yet ready to be used in, in patients. Um, so another question was, uh, what can we do to improve the tolerability of cystamine? It's again, a very, very good question. So you have seen that in the main complaint, one of the main complaints of cystinosis are gastrointestinal complaints. And these complaints can be treated quite well with the use of uh, proton pump inhibitors. However, you should realize that by um, increasing the pH of the stomach, by reducing acidity, you will influence their pharmaco 
uh, kinetics of uh, delayed release uh, system in prosthesis. So it should be taken with cautious uh, with caution in, uh, with this type of drugs. So regarding the bad smell of cystamine, it's a very, very difficult problem. And I don't personally think that we can do much about it. Patients take some things that they buy on internet to mitigate the smell, but um, it remains a problem actually. And uh, some patients choose times because when they're on prosisbe, sometimes they take the drug at the time moments like very late in the evening or somewhere during the day because the peak level of bad smell is about one, two hours after they take the drug. So when they choose the moments that they don't have a lot of social contact, sometimes it helps them to tolerate the drug to avoid this annoying side effects. Okay, thank you. I have a, a list of number of questions. We will try to go through it as we can. Uh, so uh, one question asking about when to start the cystiamine eye drop. Shall we start it uh, immediately upon the diagnosis or after the appearance of the uh, cystine crystal in the eye? Yeah, so personally, I think that you should start as soon as possible. Obviously, it's not so easy to use eye drops in babies. However, it makes sense to start as soon as possible, even to prevent the formation of cystine crystals. And also from my experience, when you started in very small kids, they get used to these drops and it is sometimes easier to administer drops in an infant than in a child who is two years of age and has all kinds of you know, behavior or uh, refusals of this age. So I personally start as soon as I diagnose cystinosis. Yeah. Uh, another question asking about, shall we wait for to confirm the diagnosis by the genetic if we have already uh, elevated the belly BC system? Yeah, so we try to, con to confirm the diagnosis um, by genetics for two reasons. Uh, because sometimes, um, because of their laboratory issues like a storage or, or some problems in laboratory detections, the levels of white blood cell cystine levels can be falsely elevated. And uh, in the past, um, not recently, we had patients like this who had a false diagnosis. Uh, once I had a, a patient, it's about 20 years ago, who was falsely diagnosed with cystinosis and he was treated for 10 years with cystiamine. Um, and then finally, um, it was a patient from a different hospital. I sent him to our ophthalmologist and he didn't have cystine crystals. So this is impossible. All cystinosis patients have cystine crystals in the eyes. And then we did the genetics and there was no mutation in the CTNS gene. And this patient appeared to have a dense disease. So it's completely different disorder. So this is one reason. And another reason is for the genetic counseling of the families, because many of these families, they would like to have another child and uh, some of these families would uh, like to perform their, uh, their, uh, the genetic screening um, during the pregnancy or even before the pregnancy or the pre-implantation diagnosis. So they like to have uh, the genetic diagnosis for this reason. Okay, uh, another question for uh, asking about what's the lifespan of such patient, such kids if left untreated? Well, the lifespan of this patient changed a lot. So obviously before kidney transplantation was available, uh, all these kids died uh, before the age of 10 uh, because of kidney failure. So when uh, kidney transplantation became available, they could survive until their uh, early adult age, um, but then they died from the extra renal complications. Nowadays, we have uh, cystamine treatment and we have kidney transplantation. So um, the oldest cystinosis patients in the world that um, I know, uh, they pass the age of 60. And there are some patients who are doing very well. There is a Mexican uh, person who passed the age of six is a very active man. He's very small because he was not treated with growth hormone, but he's active, he's working, and he's doing quite well. So there are patients who, 
who can really do well, but they really require good treatment. Thank you. Another question about can be can cystiamine be administered via a J tube? Yes, it can. So both cystiamine preparations can be administered by um, uh, by nasogastric or um, tube or gastrostomy. Uh, you will need to open or to open the capsules and to, to, to administer them with a syringe. But um, for both preparations, it is possible. Uh, another question about a prenatal diagnosis uh, during fetal life. Can, can this be done? Yes, it can. So this is another reason uh, for performing their um, their molecular diagnosis because the molecular diagnosis allows to 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 perform their genetic screening during the pregnancy before we had the possibility of genetic diagnosis um, people used to measure cysteine in the in the chorion so you needed to have the chorion puncture to measure cysteine however because the genetic diagnosis is now available. This technique is almost completely abandoned and people are using their DNA analysis of the CTNS gene for this reason. A question from uh, uh, one of my colleagues asking about, uh, you, about your experience in using Brocispi in infant. Well, um, Prosisbe can be used actually in children of all ages. However, in infants, obviously, they will not be able to swallow the capsules. So you will have to open the capsules. And in their capsules, you have these uh, small granules. And these granules can be administered in a child with water or a little bit of fruit juice. And uh, uh, so this is really possible. And um, the company is actually preparing their, their sachets where their, uh, the drug will be put in the sachets rather than the capsules. So it will be easier to solve this, uh, this preparation uh, for using it in small kids. Okay, thank you. We have uh, another question about any gene therapy uh, for cystinosis. About? Uh, any ongoing gene therapy or yeah genetic? yeah so this is uh, also a very interesting question so in our lab actually we are working on gene therapy direct gene therapy for cystinosis however um, this is really very very challenging because gene therapy is very very difficult for kidney diseases because uh, your gene of interest had to reach many different cell types in the kidneys and uh, um, this is really not trivial. So what the group of um, San Diego is doing, they are performing gene therapy in their autologous hematopoietic stem cells. So they isolate the hematopoietic stem cell of the patient and they perform ex vivo, so the gene therapy in the cells not in the patient, but ex vivo. And then they inject the autologous cells corrected with gene therapy in the patients. And that's a trial I was talking about. And uh, using this technique, uh, three cystinosis patients have been transplanted, but we have to see whether, uh, whether this therapy is efficacy. Okay, we left with another uh, two to three minutes. I will... Uh... Uh, there is a question about, uh, is there any intravenous preparation of cystiamine that can be utilized in terms of patient with some GI problem like peptic ulcer? No, so far there is no um, IV preparation. So we have to, to use the oral preparation. Okay. In the time, the first uh, clinical presentation, which was published, but the first clinical use of cystiamine, which was published, uh, was actually the IV preparation. But at that time, people just could purify the drug in their laboratory and inject it in a patient. But nowadays, obviously, it's not possible, and there is no commercially available IV cystiamine preparation. Okay. Uh, another question about how to prevent the neurologic complications. 
uh, and the neurologic complications. Yes. Yeah. So the neurologic phenotype of cystinosis is, um, um, it can be quite diverse and usually develops in patients uh, who are older than 20 years of age. So what they can present, they can present with stroke-like episodes and we actually don't really know uh, the mechanism of this presentation. But some of these patients, and I have seen it also in my patients, despite the fact that they were well treated with cystamine, they presented with a stroke light episode. And most of them have recovered. And another neurologic presentation is a peripheral neuropathy. That's a different presentation, but which also can be quite severe. And you should actually screen for both. So uh, I will ask about a uh, last question because of the time. Uh, the success rate of transplanted kidney cystinosis and what's the long life of such kidney and what's the potential cause of failure, if, the, if there is? Mm -hmm. Again, a very, very good question, uh, uh, which I could not cover in the presentation because of the lack of time. So the kidney survival in cystinosis patients after kidney transplantation is very, very good. And actually it is better than in patients with other diseases. It was shown in different cohorts in Europe and in the uh, United States. Um, so the disease doesn't recur in the graft and um, their kidney graft survival is better. So when you compare it with your other patients. So the immunosuppressive therapy is not different. However, the risk of diabetes might be elevated in cystinosis because of the use of steroids or CNIs. So uh, several clinics try to use the steroid-free regimens after kidney transplantation, but the prognosis is very good. Okay, thank you. Thank you very much, Prof. Elena, for your time and for uh, this talk and for uh, your kind answering of all the questions. Uh, still, there is a, a, a long list of questions, but I apologize from all the attendees. And they could uh, reach uh, Prof. Elena in her email that she is showing on the screen currently. Uh, thank you again, Prof. Elena. It was uh, our pleasure like, to be, for you to be with us uh, tonight. And uh, thank you for uh, everything you did. Thank you for inviting uh, me. Bye-bye. Bye-bye. Thank you. Uh, yeah. Prof. Kh Dr. Khaled. Yeah, I would like again to uh, thank uh, Prof. Elena Levchenko for really wonderful and delighting us about uh, an update about nephro uh, nephropathic cystinosis. Thank you, Majid, for excellent moderation of the, the sessions. Also, I will extend the thanks to, um, to our uh, sponsor company, Pyologics, for sponsoring this, uh, this talk and also uh, thanks for our attendees who's reaching about 3,800 attendees uh, from uh, uh, all parts of GCC and other parts in the Middle East. Thank you very much for your uh, trust and continue attending our uh, our activity. Next month, actually, we will stop. We will not have any um, any webinar next month as we are preparing uh, hardly for our uh, upcoming Congress, which will be in 18 to 20 of November with, uh, with uh, more than 60 uh, uh, lectures and uh, state of art uh, talks with the plenary sessions. So please don't forget to register. It will be free of registrations. Uh, without CME hours, and if you request CME hours, will be only uh, 200 reals. So uh, see you uh, uh, in November, inshallah. Thank you again, Elena, and see you another time with us in Saudi Society of Nephrology. Thank you. Thank you.